welcome you to the 11th Annual Santa Cruz County Artist of the Year Awards this evening. It's profile performance, as we all know, we gathered here to honor Linda Berlin Hall, our 1994 Artist of the Year. I'm Barbara Beerstein. I am chairman of the County Arts Commission and represent Jan Hughes from the First District. There are four other commissioners, each appointed by one of the four supervisors. The other commissioners include Betty Allen from the 2nd District, Marsha McDougall from the 3rd District, Diana Henderson from the 4th District, and Mary Kay Hubbard from the 5th District. So if you want to make a comment about County Arts Commission business, please do find your commissioner. You would welcome it. I would also like to welcome tonight and name our previous artists of the year. And I know we have several in the audience. And in particular, I would like to point out Lou Harrison, who is here with us tonight. Lou, would you stand please? Holland and beyond. I don't know if 
you can see, Linda's sitting back here. It's <laughs> kind of hard to um, I am extremely happy that your devotion to the good cause has found large recognition. And Marie and I are sending you our warmest congratulations. Splendid. Yours ever, Gustav. And another just arrived late this afternoon from Baroque Cellist Honor Bilsma. Honor says, Dear Linda, how wonderful to hear of your being Artist of the Year in 1994. Great Santa Cruz County, too, to be happy with its own artist. Take Holland, but oh no, being from there, I really feel really awed by your enormous knowledge of the music from the former Dutch Indies, Netherlands, Oos Indie. Linda, it has always been such a pleasure to work together. May it happen soon again at your side or mine. I'll bring my envelopes tuned in perfect sevens. Know that I am there this afternoon in the reception in spirit. And finally, from Max von Egmont, uh, a baritone, fabulous vocalist that has come to Santa Cruz as has these two other wonderful musicians as part of the Santa Cruz Baroque Festival. And Max says, Dear Linda, such good news from Santa Cruz. My congratulations for your reward, and may the 27th of May be a glorious day for you. Is life not getting too busy, and do you have enough time to spare? Again, congratulations. Your regards from your friend, Max.
Deacons representing Senator Mello. I just 
student of music myself, and as an avid fan of especially early music, I have, of course, heard of Linda and the marvelous work she was doing at the Festival of Living Music in Santa Cruz. I had also read and was fascinated by her doctoral thesis, and I was aware of her many musical and intellectual accomplishments, about which I'm sure her other colleagues will have much to say this evening. Well, I was prepared to be impressed upon meeting her, and I was, as well as charmed by the warmth of her intelligence and by her fine wit, not to mention the fact, and many of you might not know this about Linda, that she is a cat mom par excellence. I went on to become associated with Linda in the Santa Cruz Baroque Festival, first as a board member, and then for two years as its general manager, following with great difficulty in the footsteps of Peter Trostel, who will be speaking next, working closely with Linda in festival activities, and my admiration grew. As founder and artistic director of the festival, Linda has created forums to present to Santa Cruz audiences not only artists of international acclaim, such as Gustav Lane, Martin, Max von Egmont, to mention just a few, but also local artists of distinction, some of whom you'll be hearing tonight. The magic of these performances, hearing this wonderful music played today as it sounded in its own time, has, I believe, significantly enriched our lives. Linda, herself an artist of international renown and stature, has been instrumental in bringing to and sharing with our community the very best of the traditions of Western and non-Western musical cultures, expanding our horizons and uplifting our spirits. For a quarter of a century, she's been doing this. So, in closing, I'd like to thank the Arts Commission for honoring Linda as the Artist of the Year, but mainly, I wish to thank Linda for the joy that she brought to me and to thousands of other appreciative listeners whom she has reached and profoundly touched through her art. Thank you, Linda. I'm Peter Troxell, I'm the station manager for KUSP in Santa Cruz. And it was 26 years ago that I met Linda. I was in Manhattan with a friend, Paul Borg, who some of you know. And he said, I want to meet Linda. And we drove down to Princeton and found Linda, immersed in the library at night. <laughs> that was my first meeting with Linda. We went and had some leaf out in the open, some subterranean cafe in Princeton. And I knew I would have a long relationship with Linda. Um, she showed up about uh, six or eight or ten months later in Santa Cruz, where I was then living. I moved here in 1969, and she came along and came to visit Paul and myself, and ended up staying in Santa Cruz, which all of you know now is a great blessing. Linda's uh, uh, and I have uh, been associates for all these long time, and I was on the board of directors for the first year of the Festival of Living Music. Linda lived over on Ninth Avenue with her husband, Charles Hall, who I think I might have had something to do with me. You know, was, I knew Charlie and I knew Linda. I knew Charlie and I knew Linda, and suddenly it was Linda and Charlie. <laughs> and uh, they lived on Ninth Avenue, which was right on the lagoon, the Twin Lakes Lagoon, a beautiful, natural setting which was the beginning place for the festival players who met there to play and became the festival of living music. I sat on the first year board and thereafter, I, for the following 10 years, I was the general manager for the festival of living music, which then became the Santa Cruz Bureau Festival. So naturally, I have a, a long and uh, full relationship with Linda. She's a, a phenomenal person to work with. She has an extraordinary focus. And it is, uh, it is uh, it's inspiring to work with somebody who's that kind of penetration and persistence and determination. And you see that in everything that she does. She's an extremely prolific artist. As witnessed is in her home, she has a lot of rabbits. She collects rabbit motifs. <laughs> kind of a symbol of proficiency. <laughs> 
But um, one of the wonderful things I love about Linda is that she has a fabulous sense of humor. And we often don't see that because she's a performer on stage, seriously conducting her business. But of course, the Baroque theory is full of mirth and joy and uh, frivolity, and she is right there with it. I always want to have audiences know Linda from that sense of humor that she has, because it is pervasive and also inspiring. I um, obviously didn't bring a prepared speech, it's all extemporaneous, but my love of Linda and the gratitude I feel towards the community for supporting her as the artist of the year is overwhelming. Thanks very much, Linda. Music as a language, 
to understand how it can allow us to experience, to know, to express, to communicate a whole range of ideas from the fairly light ideas of entertainment and amusement to the most profound issues of human existence. So I kind of wandered from my topic here. Are you still with me? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to emphasize that Linda embodies in her work, her work in Baroque music, her work in Indonesian music, this ideal which we all, all hold so very dear, the integration of scholarship and performance. Thank you. I'd like to express my gratitude for all of this. It's um, wonderful to be here tonight and to see all of you and to be able to perform a variety of things. You know, I've never tried to change gears like this to go from Baroque to contemporary to Gamelan, so it's something very unique for me as well as something in a way familiar. I'd like to express gratitude to the County Arts Commission and to those who nominated and selected me for this special honor and especially to the staff members Liz Linsley and Melinda Van for their generosity and support and their indefatigable energy in planning this event. We've been through a lot together. The uh, community of Santa Cruz County should also be thanked, that's you, all of us here tonight, to all those who've supported the Santa Cruz Baroque Festival. I'm very grateful and its many concert and recording projects for the past 21 years. I've seen many of your faces. During this time, the festival has been able to achieve national and international recognition, but it could never have achieved any recognition without you, the audience. I'd also like to express gratitude to all those who brought the Indonesian performing arts and all their richness to this region and the local enthusiasts and the granting agencies who helped traditional and contemporary forms of Sudanese and Balinese gamelan dance and theater thrive in and around the Santa Cruz area. Special thanks to Monday Sukhar Deberg for her work in preparing Balinese traditional offerings for tonight. I'd like to thank UCSC for its occasional partnerships with both the Barak Festival and Banjar Bali Santa Cruz, including co-sponsorship of tonight's event. A special thanks to my musical colleagues in California, Europe, and Indonesia who have greatly enriched my life by making music with me. I'd also like to express my overwhelming appreciation to my students who have taught me so much, and I'm sure that many of my musical colleagues, students, and faculty are future artists of the year here or wherever they may choose to be. And last, but actually first in importance, I'd like to offer a special thanks to my mother for teaching me to make music, and to my husband, Charlie, for his constant encouragement and support of my artistic life. Even when my busyness has tried his patience, He's really been there for me every time. I'd like to say a few words about Baroque music because that's where we begin tonight on our live performance element. Uh, Baroque music is the music of the 17th and 18th century, and I'd like to say a bit about what the 20th century musician who aims to play Baroque music needs to do. First, I'd like to ask my colleagues, John and Michael, We'll perform with you to come on up and take their instruments. <laughs> First of all, the Baroque musician plays a particular instrument from the time and the place of the music. Um, John is playing the old agamba, which is different in many ways from the modern instruments that you might see that look a bit similar, certainly different from the cello. He has how many strings? Why don't you say a bit about it, John? I hope you can hear me after hearing the microphone. I'll be quite soft in comparison. Uh, it has seven strings, and it's a bit lighter than the cello, but it's the same sort of body size. The string length is about the same, but I think you'll notice it has a fretted neck at this part, not above. I play both above and on the frets. Uh, it's tuned very much like a guitar or a lute. The other major difference would be the bow, which I hold underhand. 
I've had to learn to control each note by pressure on the string with my middle finger. That's completely different from the violin family that plays overhand. Finished. <laughs> and um, Michael will be playing the Baroque violin, which is very different from the modern violin, although superficially it looks pretty similar. Well, it, it, in a sense, it suffers from looking so much like the modern violin, with the exception of the, uh, the chin rest, which is, is, is missing. But the sound, um, it represents sort of the same contrast with modern violin as my voice in an unamplified way, perhaps compares with an amplified voice, that when you begin to hear it, your ears have to focus down a little bit to get into the parameters of the instrument. Um, when we talk about the violin, um, this is the thing that was made by Stradivarius and Amati and so forth of the great names. And their instruments were changed in the course of the 19th century, basically in order to make them louder. So what has happened in, the, in a kind of revolution of the last 30 years or so is that these instruments, violins and cellos and so forth, have begun to be restored to the specifications of their original makers. So that um, this violin that I'm playing tonight was built around the year 1720, and because it was a good instrument, an instrument of quality, it was changed in the 19th century. That I won't go into all the details, but the neck primarily and some of the things inside, in order to make it project more, because the circumstances of performance, the places of performance had become larger, so the instruments had to be louder. But this has been restored to its original specifications and more fit suited to a performance uh, space of this kind of size. Thank you, Michael. The uh, work support is an 18th century French style instrument and it's on loan courteously from UC Santa Cruz. The um, Baroque musician nowadays needs to tune at the pitch that seems most appropriate to the music he or she wants to play. In our case, we're tuned around 415, about half a step below modern pitch. Today's Baroque musician also needs to practice and perform the 18th and 17th century ways of holding the instrument and playing it. The positions that are familiar from modern instruments that are similar may not be the right ones to use for the particular culture that is being performed. Today's musician interested in early music also needs to study the culture that gave rise to the music to try to apply knowledge of that culture to the music. This could include things like the pieces, historical documents, studying paintings, architecture even, other arts, particularly dance, theater, literature, and aesthetics. Many Baroque musicians nowadays would want to analyze the music, trying to understand its structure before performing it. And of course, because we are in an experimental situation, we can't simply sit back through the time machine to find out for sure. We have to do a lot of rehearsal, a lot of experiments with speed, mood, loudness, softness, sound color, and ornamentation, trying to communicate something we can believe in, a personal image of the piece to the modern audience. About the Roman ensembles, uh, they tend to be treble and bass dominated. We do see treble and bass right up here, violin and viol. The harpsichord, my instrument, is the one that tends to stitch in between these two poles, shaping the performance by accenting and decorating each phrase as it's going to be spontaneously delivered. The harpsichord makes up a part based on the bass line and on a written notation for the chords. It's called figure bass. It's a bunch of Arabic numbers that have to be translated into actual keys. The harpsichord is thus constantly improvising within this given structure, always responding to what's just been played and what just might be played, and listening to the other instruments trying to find a way to support what they do. In some aspects, in some respects, this kind of Baroque music resembles the modern idiom of jazz, or in some cases other kinds of folk music that might be very familiar to today's audience. Every performance, therefore, is unique. About our piece, uh, La Stroma Ring, it's um, an 18th century piece associated with the grandeur and majesty of the Sun King Louis XIV in France. Before the 20th century, towns were clustered around churches which tolled their great bells to announce the births, deaths, ceremonies, and special events. La Sonnerie, the Carolina of the Church Saint Genevieve up on the hill in Paris, is based on a three-note tower bell motive. Since its composer was a famous player of the um, viol, the instrument John plays tonight, the piece is very well known for its virtuosic viol and fireworks for the viol. 
Some might recognize this piece from the uh, soundtrack of the movie Tour de la Tan du Monde, which was recently in San Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to tune, which um, certainly happens for every borough concert, and move right on into the music. <coughs>
very privileged to have in the Burma Collin Art community. And of course, she draws on many of her colleagues who are uh, equally talented. I'd like to introduce one of those people who didn't work with as a colleague at the university, Dr. Mia <laughs> Miller. In fact, when you have a sonata, a Berg sonata for flute and continuo, the composer has written two lines, a flute line and a bass line, uh, which is played by the left hand, the harpsichord. Under the bass line are uh, often, but not always, figures, numbers, that indicate in a kind of shorthand what the harmonic structure is that's going on above. It is up to the harpsichordist then to improvise a right hand part based on reading these numbers. Uh, first of all, it's a very difficult task, as you can imagine. But there is also room for an enormous amount of improvisation. Uh, in the simplest form, one can just play block chords in the right hand. But one can provide little melodies. And uh, you can play chords of two notes, or three notes, or even four notes, creating different volumes of sound. And of course, this is done instantaneously with nothing written on the page. I've played with many harpsichordists. I have never played such a master of uh, this art as I have with Linda. Not only technically, I have watched her read the most uh, unbelievable scores. I have watched people put in front of her manuscripts of uh, figured bass, uh, hand scrawl in a strange clef, barely legible, and I've watched her read them no perfect. Uh, it's quite incredible. But in addition to that, she is the most inventive um, continual player. Um, you never know what she's going to do in the right hand. And the first few times we performed, I was a little taken aback because sometimes at the concert I would hear things that I had never heard before. <laughs> um, but I soon, I soon learned that no matter what she was doing, she was always in the right place at the right time. And um, she, her flights of fancy were fabulous. Uh, she was always also attuned to what the other players were doing. I can remember one incident in particular when I made a small error in my part, and she immediately imitated me in her right hand. <laughs> Please don't be scared by the fact that this piece was written uh, a little more than, uh, well, let's see, 1982, so 12 years ago. Uh, that should not threaten you. Uh, I'm going to give you a little introduction to what you'll hear. The composer of the work is Robert Strizich, and Bob, are you here tonight? Yes. Ah, there he is. <laughs> memory of a man, Jason Paris, who played the viola de gamba, which you've just uh, seen uh, John play just a moment ago. And Jason um, died in a freak drowning accident in the Rhine when he was in his 20s. And uh, was a friend of Bob's, and the piece was written, actually he's a friend of mine as well, and we went to graduate school with him. And this piece was written in his memory. Um, the piece has three movements, but they are continuous. But let me tell you some of the things to listen for. 
Uh, the opening movement is a portrait of Jason, uh, and it presents the musical uh, styles that interested him, of course, Baroque music being the primary one. A couple of Baroque-type parts of this movement that you uh, should listen for. One is a broken chord style that you'll hear in the harpsichord playing chords that are played one note at a time. Uh, this was a typical Baroque style, and of course it keeps the sound from dying away because it's, it's sustained by um, breaking the chord over uh, a longer period of time than if you just played it and held it. A second uh, Baroque reference is a canon section. There's uh, one part near the beginning where Linda begins a melodic line, and I didn't say her exactly one measure later. But Jason was also interested in non-Baroque music, and there is a jazz rock section near the beginning where she plays a series of repeated chords, and I do a kind of an improv over it. And there is also a blues section, which I think you'll recognize. <laughs> the um, second movement, and again, goes continuously. These movements are separated only by the cadenza passages in either the food or the harpsichord. The second movement is the actual drowning. And it's, it's, every time we play this piece, we feel like we're killing Jason over and over. It's quite an uh, overwhelming experience. Um, in any case, uh, you will hear the drowning introduced. Um, when the actual drowning takes place, Linda plays a, a, a fearsome set of uh, rising chromatic. Why do that? Demonstrate a little bit of that. <laughs> Show them a little of that uh, waves of water.
artists in our community who will now introduce us about the Gamelon, Lou Harrison. Dancing um, 
dances which I hope that uh, Linda herself will explain more about to you because I'm unfamiliar with them. They will have a group dance by Nimadi Sukerti and um, uh, Imade Surya. That's on your program, so you'll be able to follow it. Incidentally, the I, which is pronounced E, indicates that it's a man, and if it's an I or me, it's a woman. It's very simple. So, to the Gamelon Outdoors in the Tropics. Thank you.